Hi everyone, it's Mrs. Wallace. I just wanted to do this quick video on uh, the long run ATC. So we've been working in class on uh, cost curves and of course we're interested in the per unit uh, cost curves. We've also looked at uh, total cost curves, so total variable, total fixed, uh, total cost. Um, in this case, we're really limiting the discussion to the average total cost, but rather than looking at it in the short run, we're gonna be looking in the long run. And if we were to kind of uh, graph, right, um, and we show marginal costs, and we also show typically what an ATC curve looks like, I could kind of note this is what it looks like in the short run. And maybe if I was interested in kind of describing to you what it looks like in the long run, I would draw a marginal cost curve and I would draw the ATC, okay? And in this case, instead of regular ATC, I'm gonna describe this as the long run ATC. And if you look at these, you might say, wow, <laughs> that doesn't really look all that different. And you would be right. It's really hard to look at an average total cost curve and know if it's in the long run or the short run. But once you're told that an average total cost curve is either in the short run or the long run, um, there are certain um, characteristics about the cost curve that are really important. So first of all, uh, one thing we'll look at is just the definition of the long run compared uh, to the short run. So in the long run, um, we kind of also call the long run the planning curve. You know, think of uh, the short run as being a situation where you have both fixed and variable costs. In the long run, all costs are variable, okay? What does this mean? It means that the firm can completely control and change everything about uh, their variable and fixed resources. This might mean uh, I want four factories producing cupcakes instead of uh, one. This might mean I can look potentially at having um, eight uh, tractors to grow my corn instead of two. Um, any possibility of um, capital, labor, and raw materials, any possible combination is definitely um, feasible in the long run, okay? Uh, the long run ATC, of course, is different than the short run ATC, despite the fact that they look exactly the same, what we're going to describe is the really key difference is what is um, creating the shape of the long run ATC. Because the short run um, average total cost curve is related to that entire concept of the uh, law of diminishing uh, marginal returns, and because we don't have fixed costs in the long run, we have this strangeness where we have the exact same look of the ATCs. You know, here's your short run ATC, here's your long run ATC. Um, they don't necessarily have to look this way in the long run, typically they do, um, even though they look the same, the reasons behind the shapes of those curves um, are different, okay? And so that's what we're really gonna be focusing on today is the shape of the long run ATC, okay? And why it's that case. And it is important to recognize that of course the long run ATC could also be constant. It could also have a shape that's different than this, uh, but typically it looks something like this. Okay, the way that the long run ATC uh, curve works is we're consistently looking at a, um, a graph with the x-axis being output, okay? So let's say that this is particular quantities of cupcakes, okay? So this is a uh, bakery. Let's say that this is, um, I don't know, uh, Mark's Bakery, and he is a cupcake baker, and he is thinking ahead to like next year or even the year after. You know, the pandemic's going to be over. His cupcakes are kind of popular. You know, how uh, could he pursue, um, you know, building uh, up his uh, firm and, you know, what are the possibilities? So um, there might be, on average, um, some total costs per cupcake, okay? Um, but the average total cost might differ depending on the combination of resources that Mark puts in place, okay? Um, so for example, if Mark wanted to do 10 cupcakes, right, he might be in a position where he could operate at this ATC, let's say it's $5 per cupcake, um, and he would be on this cost curve, okay, which kind of considers a certain quantity of labor, a certain quantity of factory space and whatnot. 
Um, another possibility might be to look at a totally different combination of resources and to um, look at what happens with your um, average total cost with that new combination of resources. And there's really, you know, endless possibilities of um, short run cost curves that potentially we could line up together, okay? Um, maybe to do 100 cupcakes, uh, Mark might be in a position where he could either choose to be on this cost curve right here, okay, at this spot, or to be on the third cost curve. Maybe the third cost curve, this one right uh, here, um, might have, I'm kind of designing it a little thicker here, this cost curve might uh, have um, a combination of four uh, factories and 25 ovens and a certain amount of labor, okay? And maybe with that certain combination, the cost per cupcake could be much lower than $5, okay? At that same combination of 100, it's very possible with a different set of resources that are kind of expressed by the second cost curve, um, maybe there would be a much, much higher uh, average total cost, okay? So um, you're kind of looking at what are my options? And, you know, we could put any number of different um, resource options. And uh, what we're gonna look at is how we get the long run cost curve basically by kind of creating a smooth curve from the lowest points of all of our short run cost curve possibilities, okay? Okay, everyone, so the bottom line is that we're looking to uh, make a smooth curve. So if you see kind of the blue uh, curve that represents your long run ATC, what we've done is we've kind of put on a piece of paper, right, a whole bunch of short run uh, cost curves, again, that are reflective of different resource combinations. Um, and we are looking at the minimum points on every single one of those cost curves and just creating a smooth long run ATC, okay? And it kind of suggests to us as we increase our outputs, okay, what ultimately would be uh, the lowest um, ATC that we could get and we could kind of correlate that with, well, what um, combination of resources then do I need to have in order to acquire those um, lower ATCs, right? Sometimes we increase our production as firms uh, for the purpose of having a lower um, ATC, okay? So I might be enticed to actually look at this graph and say, wow, I'd really like to be uh, producing maybe rather than this output here, maybe I'd rather be producing output Y because I might be able to achieve um, a lower uh, ATC, okay, a lower average total cost, sometimes the combination of resources. And I also can kind of use this to say, if I did want to produce, say, a Y um, output, maybe I um, could look at which cost um, combination would be best for me. Is it uh, ATC3 or is it ATC4? And if it's ATC4, then I know that I'm looking uh, to kind of say what kind of um, resources uh, do I need to um, line up in order to be operating at this quantity of Y, um, but with the ATC uh, at this point, okay? Not that I definitely have to operate there, um, it's just that I'm interested in over a variety of different resource combinations and at variety of different quantities, what are uh, my potential uh, costs going to be, at least average total costs. Once we have an idea, okay, and I'm just going to kind of draw a typical long run ATC, okay, we kind of saw something like this shape, kind of a bowl shape, if this is our long run ATC, okay, we tend to see some portions of our long run ATC that are um, downward sloping, okay, like this portion right here, okay, when we see ATC generally decreasing over greater and greater and greater quantity, um, we know that we're generally getting economies of scale, okay? Um, there is a definition of economies of scale. Basically, if I was to increase um, my inputs, let's say a percentage, let's say 10%, um, I would see my outputs increase greater than 10%, okay? So if I take all of my inputs and I increase them 10%, but my output increases greater than 10%, I know that I am seeing um, economies of scale. Economies of scale are displayed graphically by looking at over greater and greater and greater uh, quantities, 
um, a lower and lower ATC, okay, declining ATC. Why does this happen, okay? Sometimes we get lower and lower ATC over greater and greater quantities because of labor specialization, okay? Probably the key thing. Um, maybe there is um, uh, more ability to have um, labor that is um, at greater quantities, organized to do specific tasks, um, much more efficient, greater productivity. When those types of things happen, uh, specialization, very, very efficient labor, we end up with economies of scale. Uh, managerial specialization, we might end up with a situation where we have a management team that is uh, creating uh, new resources for, say, marketing a product or new resources for um, advertising, new resources for a variety of things, we might see some of that managerial specialization in a variety of different departments uh, lead to um, cost uh, reductions. Um, efficient capital, okay, capital improvements, technology improvements, faster Wi-Fi, um, those types of things may lead to greater efficiency, greater uh, productive efficiency, and that may lead to economies of scale. Uh, there's a variety of other factors too that can lead to economies of scale. Largely, we're talking about economies of scale being indicative of uh, lower ATC over greater and greater quantities, okay? Um, but the reason why the ATC, uh, long run ATC curve is declining is not because of um, the issue of declining um, marginal uh, returns. You know, this has to do with um, the economies of scale, okay? Constant returns to scale would be if we had an ATC curve that started to look like this, okay? Some section of the ATC curve is constant, okay? And basically the definition for this would be if I increase the inputs, okay, by 10% and my outputs increase at exactly 10%, I have constant returns to scale, okay? It's demonstrated graphically like this, okay? This is a long run ATC that is constant, okay? And it's demonstrating constant returns to scale. A situation that is demonstrating diseconomies of scale, okay, here's quantity, here's ATC. This is gonna be our long run ATC curve. If we have something like this, there's going to be a section here where our long run ATC is definitely increasing. So ATC is increasing over greater and greater and greater quantities. This section here is going to be um, descriptive of diseconomies of scale. How can diseconomies of scale happen and what does that mean? Uh, it means if I was to increase my inputs let's say in this case, uh, 50%, I have, you know, taken all of my inputs, my labor, my raw materials, everything, increase them by 50%. Maybe I've increased my outputs, okay, but increased it by uh, 10%, okay? In that case, I have diseconomies of scale, okay? I've generated a lot more inputs um, into my process, but I haven't really gotten greater outputs, okay? Um, or significant greater outputs. In this case, there's issues, and I'm going to see as a result of that long run ATC, okay? Diseconomies of scale is basically going to be um, coordination problems, control, just like empires that get too big and, you know, leaders can't necessarily enable, you know, everything to happen throughout all of the empire. They can't coordinate all of the activities. Some parts are in revolt and nothing can be done. You know, firms can also get too big. Um, a great example of this is um, Target at one point uh, created a giant expansion uh, into Canada. When they went to open on day one, they were not ready. They had gotten too big too quickly, um, set up expectations so much that people in Canada flocked to targets on the first day only to find empty shelves. And over time, that became a really problematic part of targets expansion, okay? So um, an example of diseconomies of scale would be something like that, a firm that just kind of gets uh, to a place where they have um, lots of uh, coordination problems, largely because of either, you know, issues of quality of their resources or uh, they've over um, overbuilt. Um, they could have communication problems. They could have worker alienation. 
a great deal of like disconnect between maybe leadership and what workers are doing. I'm shirking might mean, you know, people are checking their email, people are doing a whole bunch of things at work that's not productive, okay? So if you think of economies of scale as incredibly efficient productivity, okay? So, you know, the use of uh, robots to enhance productive capacity, that's economies of scale. Some firms might actually look at acquiring a great deal of robotic technology because it might enable, you know, greater efficiency and in the long run, a decrease in ATC. In the case of diseconomies of scale, we've uh, seen the firm make decisions that lead to, you know, long run ATC actually increasing um, a great deal of uh, problems and a lack of productivity. Okay, paying workers, for example, a full salary for sitting around not doing their particular, um, you know, job, that's going to create uh, expensive um, issues. Your, you know, your bang for your buck is not going to be there. Okay. Okay, the last thing to mention is this concept of minimum efficient scale. If we had a graph and we were looking at ATC here, a quantity, say, of cupcakes here, and I've got a graph that's, you know, something like this for my long run ATC, which is a fairly typical shape. Again, you might have a marginal cost curve that's kind of intersecting here. So this is what makes it look uh, fairly uh, typical. But if we had something like this and we say, okay, there's a section that's uh, e economies of scale, a section that's diseconomies of scale, a section that's constant returns to scale. What is the lowest output that I could actually produce um, where my long run ATC is minimized, okay? And say that I argued that this section right here was all constant, okay? That maybe my constant returns to scale would start somewhere here around this quantity of say 100 cupcakes, okay? Um, that would be my minimum efficient scale, okay? If I make 100 cupcakes, um, that would be the place where I could, that would be the lowest quantity that I could make um, where I still could have an ATC that was, you know, the lowest possible. Um, certainly if I made, you know, 400 cupcakes, I might still have that same, uh, you know, uh, low ATC, but if I want to know what's the lowest quantity, I could produce that to kind of take advantage of that lowest uh, ATC, uh, it would be 100, okay? And sometimes minimum efficient scale is a useful thing for firms to pay attention to. It might kind of enable, in a sense, you know, a decision for the firm about where they might um, choose to produce. Okay, so on some questions in class, you might actually be asked to explain economies of scale, constant returns to scale, and diseconomies of scale. Oftentimes, this is part of like the multiple choice section on the AP exam. You might also be asked about different quantities of output. So for example, at quantity uh, Q1, right, is this a uh, firm that is, you know, in economies of scale? You know, it's really, this is our minimum efficient scale at quantity uh, Q1. We're really looking at quantity Q1, uh, where we start to see constant returns to scale. Right after quantity uh, Q2, uh, then we see the beginning of diseconomies of scale, okay? Oftentimes, we look at economies of scale. It's kind of a positive thing for a firm, right? And if you were uh, faced with an ATC, you know, that looked like uh, this is your MC and your ATC, if we were given kind of a point maybe of quantity at say 100, you might ask be just ask the simple question, at the quantity of 100, is the um, long run ATC in economies of scale, diseconomies of scale, or constant returns to scale? Well, if I go up you know, to this point on the long run ATC, I know it's in the declining portion of my curve. It has to be economies of scale. Okay, it's a very typical uh, question on the free response section of the AP exam. Okay, in which case you're, um, you could have a long run ATC that looks something like this, um, in which case your marginal cost curve might uh, look something like that. Okay, and this would be your maybe a uh, long run ATC. Okay, it is entirely possible that you can have a very lengthy section of economies of scale. Arguably, there are some uh, firms that are seeing incredible economies of scale. Um, some industries lend themselves to this because the more they increase their facility size, 
the more they have economies of scale. And this is um, kind of a feature of some industries. If you look at um, the production of airplanes, for example, uh, there's not a whole lot that I could do if I wanted to build an airplane in my garage. It really requires a great deal of scale. Um, I need large scale uh, factories. I need a large scale amount of uh, facilities. So, you know, for a firm that's going to make like, you know, one airplane, right? Um, the costs on average would be really high to do that, right? Um, ultimately, the more and more and more you uh, create a larger quantity of planes and you have economies of scale, you might have facilities that um, enable a great deal more planes to be built, um, you know, specialized facilities, large, you know, production capital that makes the wings of a plane. Um, it's not the kind of product that you tend to make, you know, one of, right? It's not like a arts and craft that you might do, um, you know, in your uh, garage, right? Like something like um, a an artist might make a sculpture that might be uh, a one of, right? But something like an airplane might be, uh, have larger economies of scale. Okay. So it makes it uh, hard to compete in some industries, um, unless you happen to be a firm that can actually get in with the investment of lots of economies of scale, which is when we see um, firms that have significant economies of scale in their ATC curves, um, it kind of suggests that this is a fairly difficult industry to get uh, competitive with. Um, arguably, a company like Amazon, you know, is kind of uh, experiencing something like this as well. It might have significant economies of scale. In order to compete with Amazon, you need to be able to compete, you know, uh, with their economies of scale. So to some degree, it can be an advantage. You can also have um, long run ATCs that have a shape that, you know, is something like this, in which case, you know, the marginal cost curve would be doing something like that. And here you would um, be in a position of just noting that fairly quickly you have diseconomies of scale. Okay, so um, with an industry uh, graph like this, you might have just kind of a suggestion that um, you might have lots and lots and lots of uh, quantity, but you could have a variety of maybe very uh, small firms in a situation like this because, um, you know, very, very quickly one firm uh, could become uh, very, very, very large and uh, reach um, econo diseconomies of scale uh, pretty quickly. So this might be an industry like cupcakes, for example, uh, where for the most part, if you're specializing in making a certain type of flavorful velvet cupcakes, you know, in a market that is fairly local, you know, you're um, producing kind of uh, a specialized product that doesn't necessarily require huge economies of scale. Um, and you might quickly end up with diseconomies of scale because you might lose some of that you know, very specialized kind of flavor or ingredients or whatever it might be. Um, some, you know, products typically tend to have a long run ATC that's much more this shape. And of course, you could also see a long run ATC that's completely constant. This is something that you'll see on the AP exam, okay, where you might have a long run ATC, something like that, okay? All right, I just wanted to give you this uh, brief introduction to the long run and, um, give you a chance to, uh, you know, kind of just get introduced to it. There's a reading for you um, from uh, the Krugman textbook. It's a really nice reading that describes the long run ATC well. I'm going to recommend taking a look at that reading. Um, this is key content for the AP exam, um, but one that I'm kind of uh, suggesting you read about, look at this video, get introduced to on your own before we look at it in class. Okay. Have a great rest of the weekend, everyone. Take care.